Uh, I'm Tim Goodman. I'm the chief TV critic at The Hollywood Reporter. And thanks for coming out to this creator's talk. I think this one's going to be fun because we're going to be all over the map. Um, we're going to be drinking, right? Yeah, we're going to be drinking, so that's good. Um, but I wanted to say that we actually have a sponsor. So uh, tonight's event is sponsored, presented by ACFC West. And uh, let's give a round of applause for them for the support. And so um, before, before we get to the talk, we're going to see the, the show. So I want to just bring up um, uh, Simon Davis Berry to explain a little bit about uh, what we're going to see. And then after you see it, we'll sit down, we'll do Q&A, and we'll get into all kinds of stuff. And there'll be some time for you guys to ask questions as well. Simon? Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you guys for coming out. Um, the, uh, the, you know, the sad truth is uh, s this show is not available in Canada yet because Super Channel went bankrupt. Um, <laughs> welcome to Canadian Television. This is, the, this is, this is my Tuesday now. Um, so it's really great that you guys are here to see this because it's kind of other than BitTorrent the only way you can see it in Canada right now. Uh, this is the pilot episode of Van Helsing. Um, and even though this is a, a uh, it's called a creator um, uh, summit today or a creator panel, uh, the truth is this was a group effort between uh, Neil Labute, myself, and several other writers. So um, keep that in mind, and uh, we'll talk about that with Tim, I'm sure. And uh, please enjoy this pilot episode of Van Helsing. Thank you. All right. How is everybody? All right, we're going to kind of wing it here because this yeah. is fun. And we're winging it. Yeah, we're winging it. We were just sitting outside talking about industry stuff, so we're ready to go. Hey, how are you? Um, so let's let's just quickly start. Let's circle back to to uh, Van Helsing and the there was a, you know we were talking about like kind of laughing about how the jazz score at the beginning was not right and and they or was it or was that right? Did Maybe you really it would have fixed the show. I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> And uh, they previously apologized without any need, need to. We were like, oh, whatever, we'll throw with it. But I said, the bottom line is, it's like technically, it's not your show. So yeah. right. So this tell is, us about this that. This was a very unique um, process. Most shows, as you guys probably expect, are driven by somebody writes a pilot script or has a pilot idea. They sell that to a broadcaster. The broadcaster then takes that script, makes a decision, and says, yeah, let's order a bunch more episodes. Uh, and make this show. That's not what Van Helsing was. Van Helsing is, I think, symptomatic of a new way of making TV, which the where the broadcaster will come up with the idea, <clears throat> um, assemble a creative team, and essentially uh, give them marching orders to execute the show that they want on the air. Mm -hmm. I've never heard of. I had before this process. I had never heard of that before. I had never heard of the mandate of a season of television without a writer walking into a room or pitching an idea or writing a script. It was, and I've never worked any other way. Right. So it was very unique and, um, and very interesting. Personally, it was interesting to be in that, in that process because I've been so accustomed to the other version where you make your, you, you make your stamp right. and you say, here's what the show is going to be. And hopefully people line up in terms of the money and the broadcasters. This was very, very different. Yeah, because normally you go in, it would be your baby, right? You bring it in, and then you've just slaved over it the whole time, and this is, you love it, and you bring it in, and you're protective of anybody messing it up. In this case, they were like, here, you guys, go make a show. Yeah, you have a vision. Mm -hmm. And it, it was interesting to not only be part of a process where that wasn't driving everything, mm -hmm. but then to have Neil LeBue involved, who is, has, is a brand. Mm -hmm. And you would have a certain set of expectations with something Neil would work on. I mean, I'm sure all of you may be familiar with um, In the Company of Men uh, or uh, Nurse Betty or some of his plays like Fat Pig that are very uh, deliberate social explorations of how people treat each other and male and female relationships, misogyny. I mean, it's really not the first name that you think of when it comes to vampires, <laughs> which is very, which again became very um, intriguing part of this process. Why would, uh, why would sci-fi, uh, a network that's not really known for that material, be bringing in someone like that? So it all made it all very. I have to be honest. I had no idea what I was getting into because there was no pilot to read, 
Uh, but when I saw the people assembled, I was like, this doesn't make any sense, so I want to be part of it. <laughs> also, yeah. Honestly, that was it. It was like, this doesn't make sense. This could be fun. Yeah, I mean, that, that's an amazing challenge. Also, you, it, it must be weird to think like Neil LeBute and, 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 and it wasn't even, his, again, it wasn't even like his, it wasn't like they were going to be a bunch of male dickhead vampires, <laughs> right? Misogynistic. Wait till episode three. Yeah, and then it gets, then they get more like a Neil LeBute play. But, um, so what was it like in, in the room? We were just talking as the, the, uh, with John as well. Like, uh, what was it like in the in the writers' room where, where you you are starting something from scratch and no one really is? Uh, it's not their baby. They're not super invested in it, but they also want to make something good and 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 make a good show. Well, that's it. You 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 normally walk into a writers' room situation like that, and there is a clear defined leadership from a creative point of view. And you're, I think, most writers in the writers' room are hoping to lean in to the vision and say, oh, we have, a, we have a captain, we have someone who has a clear vision of what it was. With uh, Van Helsing, it really became kind of this co collaborative conversation. And there were six of us, right, John? Six, yeah. John Walker, who's the co-EPs here. Stand up, John. Say what he, John did a ton of great work on Van Helsing. Um, and we were all, even though we were all different tiers, uh, there were there was clearly Neil was you know the boss and I was brought in to be Neil's right hand and there were other writers with more and less experience. We all looked around at each other in the room and said, "What do we want to make?" Because no one had given us really the rules of what the show needed to be. And for the at the first in the outset, we I think all just looked at each other and said, "Here's what I like, here's what I don't like," and it was very open, bizarrely open actually. And um, um, my job was pretty clear, was I was there to keep the momentum going so that we had, that we met our deadlines and we met our, our obligations to the broadcaster and to, the, to be on schedule. But the, uh, the other writers were really um, pitching the show they wanted to watch. And Neil became kind of the arbiter of that. And, um, and not being a genre guy, I think was just really absorbing a lot of the information and trying to figure out how those ideas could could be um, um, absorbed into his vision yeah. or, or as he developed his vision because I think that may be more the accurate description of this process. Yeah, it's it's really odd how how this show uh, came about. I mean, you really don't see it that way, but it could be we might be seeing more of this because there's a race to get things on the air, right? Yeah, I think we're going to, I've already heard, now Sci-Fi's already come to me again and said, uh, we have this idea for a show about a haunted town. Mm -hmm. A town, like a ghost, traditional ghost story, but instead of a haunted house, it's a haunted, small haunted town. Go. Right. And it's like, whoa, um, <laughs> that's it? And they're like, yeah, we want it on the air next year. <laughs> Holy shit. Uh, okay. Start thinking, and you know you already are thinking about when you're going into production. So you're backing up with the room and trying to figure out what the show is going to be. Really strange way of doing business f compared to the last 20 years of me essentially trying to come up with an idea and going out and pitching it. I think more places are going to start doing this. Uh, Netflix, I have already heard, has started cherry picking certain things and, and assembling mm. uh, creative team to execute. So I think the um, you're right, the race to get content may drive this m formula in a way that we haven't seen before. And it's, and it's really hit and miss. I mean, I'm, if I'm looking at it from a TV critic perspective, it's really hit and miss because there's been so many misses where someone comes in, I mean, uh, there's a lot, lot of shows where someone comes in and I want to do this, and they're like, we don't really need that, but we do need this soap opera. <laughs> and yeah. then at the same time, you're a creator and you also you want to pay rent. And so you're like, well, it's not what show I want to do, but they're they're giving me a show, like an actual show, not like a. You might get this. You got this. Yeah. Now make it, and it's not the show. So sometimes, if you got a really good person behind it, you can get something out of it. And other times, it, the combination is really not going to work. Um, what when you were all in the room and sitting down? Because you have obviously you have uh, genre experience, uh, and there's so many layers to this creator talk with with Simon because this situation he's in with this show and then beyond is really amazing but so you've done continuum um they're basically bringing you in to be a showrunner to groom a showrunner yep. in neil um 
But when you sit down and you've done genre work, he hasn't, and you've got a vampire, one of the oldest genres, what was that like saying, like, how do, how do we move around everything everybody's going to expect from us? It's a great question. It's, I'm going to get a little inside baseball here just because um, everyone here is a personal friend of mine. I know you're not going to tell tales out of school. Um, so no let's just be honest. We were working for sci-fi, and our lead-in was Z Nation. We knew that, in, we knew that a year ago. So when, you're, when the network is sci-fi and they're saying to you, we want a show that's going to be on the air after Z Nation, you know there's a certain kind of uh, bar. It's low. <laughs> I'll be honest. We, the, we sat around the room as writers the first day and we said, we know that the bar is low. Let's just all be clear here. We can, we can all work this year and do a really shitty show about vampires if we want, and we'll probably not be yelled at. Or we can try and punch above our weight, because we have no money. We have a very small budget. We have low expectations from our broadcaster. And please, if this video gets on the air before my next show, I'm going to murder. Um, but the truth is, and I'm, I think this is helpful information. I'll say it because it is helpful. You know the box you've been put in as a writer. You, to, to pretend that you're not aware of the marketplace is really false. Yeah. Look, you you are given a, a great opportunity, but you're not on HBO on Sunday night. You're on Sci-Fi at on, at ten o'clock at night. So you get it. You, and if you don't get it, you should you should figure it out because it's going to help you. So all you can do is really impress. You go well. We can we can uh, we can lean into low expectations and survive, or we can make ourselves happy because we're all TV fans and we don't want to work for an entire year really hard and not be at least a little bit uh, you know, happy with the results. So you kind of figure out, how can we do that? How can we be subversive enough to inject something different and um, savvy enough to give them what they want? Right. And that was the first conversation. The first conversation was, let's, be, let's, all call, let's have a come to Jesus moment of like, this is what the expectations are. How can we figure out a way to make the show look like what they want and do something different. It may not be obvious in the pilot, but I think in the second and third episode, it starts to get a little bit more nuanced in the sense that we were trying to make a show we would stomach. Right. And hopefully the audience would go, oh, this is better than I expected on a sci-fi 10 p.m. Right. post Z Nation slot. Right. And really that was our goal, was like, can we make ourselves happy? Yeah, well, and, and I think genre is an area where you can play with that a little bit more because the a genre uh, audience, the fans are going to say, okay, and, and also I think uh, P, uh, TV people or TV viewers now are a little bit savvy. They know that a pilot is probably not the best representation of what the series will be. It might be completely different in the second season or second episode. Yeah. So they'll kind of go with it a little bit more. And genre is like, okay, you're going to give me this vampire yeah. thing. You know, and, and then where are you going to take it? How are you going to surprise me? And I, I think that what you're saying there um, can happen in these uh, in these uh, series. And so, um, were you able because you've already finished the season? Or were you able to um, get everybody in the writers' room and then <clears throat> meet these expectations? Where like, let's do some stuff where we're, it's going to be a wink and a nod here, and then people we're going to freak people out on this level. Or were you able to meet those little like you say creative? Well, the, the, yeah, that's a great question because the politics of TV now is that if the network sees the pilot and is happy and they get the numbers they want, they kind of leave you alone. Mm. And um, so then you're then you're left with enough rope to hang yourself potentially or not. <laughs> so what happened on Van Helsing was really interesting is that when we delivered the pilot episode, we were still in production and we were still writing and we got a real good sense of what the broadcaster wanted out of the pilot. So for example, you guys saw the opening scene of, of her being attacked. Well, that wasn't, we didn't write that. The, the, the original script for the pilot was a much slower burn. And, uh, and it started with really establishing the world of the hospital and the, and the banality, if I may say, yeah. of that. The banality of survival. Yeah. And it was a much more kind of languid, um, uh, kind of put you in a false sense of security because nothing happened right. for a long time and then it all went to shit. Right. And the network saw that and we're like, no, yeah. <laughs> we need a whammy out of the gate. And we're like, okay. It's not like we didn't expect it. Mm -hmm. We did. So we recut that attack to have 
Vanessa's you know initial attack be front loaded and it became essentially a flash forward or a flashback. And the network was happy with that because they had their whammy at the top and then we could, we, they felt like we weren't gonna lose the audience in the first three seconds, which is an awful thing to have to think about, but this is how networks think. And so once they saw the pilot and they were like, wow, this, this is good, it's got that whammy at the top and that twist at the end, they kind of let us go. And then we realized, well, can, now we can make the show uh, drift towards uh, maybe something we want to do more, but with the understanding that we still have to service what the expectations are. And, and you're right, genre get, allows you to do that in a way because you have the blood button mm -hmm. or the gore button right. or the crazy violent scene button, yeah. which creates the illusion that you're hitting those markers act by act. And the network will be thrilled because right. they go, oh, great act out, great action sequence, great surprise. And they don't really comment on the other stuff you're doing, the character building. Yeah. So we do, I feel, have a great character story that pays off in very twisty, turny, fun ways uh, later in the season. Mm -hmm. uh, and probably, if I'm being honest again, to the detriment of the show, it becomes much more personal mm -hmm. as the show goes on in right. the first season, which may actually disappoint the viewers who want the visceral, bloody, gory, consistency that the pilot kind of uh, promised. <laughs> so, so the bait and switch, basically. A little bit. No. But you know, it's, it, I think that one of the things, too, that, that, that's good about that is, is to, be, to have a show that actually people are going to get to in the ninth episode or sixth episode when you can give them these magical surprises and things that yeah. pays off as writers, um, you do have to acknowledge <laughs> that it's, a, it's commerce. Um, and you do have to acknowledge that in 2016, there's, I, I said this earlier during the other uh, panel, uh, that we're approaching 500 scripted series. Um, and so to stand out in that field, yeah, you really have to like, you can't put people to sleep in the first um, episode, especially because as you, as you noted, it's, it, it's not HBO where, you, and it's not just because HBO does good shows, because if you've watched it, they do, they do some shitty shows. But, but what their built-in thing that, that they have is that you paid for it already, right? You already gave them your 18 bucks that month, and so you're like, well, I'll watch four of these because I already paid for it. And so that's the luxury of the HBO creator, is they're like, yeah, we can slow, slow ball it here. Sci-fi, any other channel, basically, if your ratings don't pop in that first week, yeah. you won't be able to get to tell the stories that you, yeah. you really want to tell. We're highly aware of that. And yeah. the only benefit to uh, Van Helsing, we knew optically, was the show was so inexpensive mm -hmm. that we weren't going to be an embarrassment to the broadcaster mm -hmm. if it didn't hit a home run. Right. Because, you know, when sci-fi sci has tiers, all broadcasters have tiers of what they invest. If it's the, if they're putting all the money in, like the studio component and the broadcaster, and they basically own the show up to three three and a half million dollars, they have huge stakes. At, at, at this show has to succeed because it's the real money that they've gambled. But with Van Helsing, it's essentially the what we call the acquisition model, where they're looking, even though they commissioned it, they're looking at it as a Canadian show mm -hmm. and that they are acquiring. So they've created a, a Canadian production model that they acquire back. Wow. from the producers. So the, the risk is quite low compared to like a show like The Expanse, for example, which mm -hmm. is UCP, the studio arm of Universal, Sci-Fi, which is a Universal channel, all putting all their eggs in that basket of right. a show that, is, that needs to succeed. Now, do you, do you find that as a writer, you, so you wrote a couple of episodes, uh, directed a few, uh, a couple this year, your executive producer on all of them, um, did you find that, or did you, and because you've been through Continuum, you've had to stretch money and be creative in different ways, particularly in the last season of Continuum where you had a fewer episodes and had to get it all done. Uh, do you ever find that like not having as much money as say like vinyl, <laughs> you know, or Game of Thrones, uh, where it's it, it, some that's its own burden, and not having as money as much money, you have to be creative and can be creative. In it forces you to be creative. Yeah, there's there are there are definitely disadvantages to having too much money, and we've seen it. We see we see what happens when the the money drives the the promise of what a show should be. Um, ironically. Um, I had the opportunity to write and direct an episode of Van Helsing, episode 11, 
And I actually went to the producer and I said, I want you to give me the, the, the smallest budget. I want to have no money in a way that would force me to do a story that could have to be intimate and really not uh, burdened by um, artifice. Mm -hmm. It was a sneaky play because I was essentially saying, I don't want any action because <laughs> action swallows up production and you end up getting less show. And they thought I was being this benevolent, you know, love, m nice guy saying, oh, you want to have less money? Of course. But it was really for me as a director to actually have to be able to play with my with the actors and the characters because there would be no expectation of of a big action episode. So is it a bottle episode? Kind of, but it doesn't feel like a bottle episode because it takes place out in the in, in the world. But it's an intimate it's an intimate forehander essentially is what it is. But it was disguised. Uh, I I basically said this will be better for me as a director to not have the burden of action, and I'll I'll frame it in having less money. Yeah. And everyone lined up to help me wow. because yes. they thought this is great for the show. Mm -hmm. So, and it was at a time late in the season where we were already we were already thinking about how much money had been spent and where we could save. So I was kind of solving a bigger problem as an executive producer, right. which was how can we take money uh, out of the show and save it for the the big finish. But it, I was being very self-serving, actually. But it, but in some ways, it almost it almost uh, it almost validates their trust in you as bringing you in as somebody who's done it before and is an executive producer who did run a show where Neil didn't. Um, and late in the run, you're able to say, look at the basically the gas tank and say, we're, yeah. we're running out of money. Yeah. And you knew that you could do it because you've done it before. Well, that's where that's why writers are producers on television because with the you can you can fix problems with words. You you can fix the show financial burdens with uh, with uh, a pen uh, and you don't want someone who isn't a writer fixing those problems right. because what will happen is they end up just seeing numbers and removing numbers from that and they don't actually think of the context of what characters evol evolution is what the relationships are so it's really easy actually as a writer to do that to be the guy who cuts the money out because you go um, oh, I already know that I can preserve what's important, the relationships, the characters, uh, the stakes, without it being about a big action sequence that's going to be expensive for, for the wrong reasons. Right. Well, there's a, I may have told you this story. I, I won't. He will go nameless. There was an American um, uh, executive at a channel that I love that does great product, um, still does do great product, and he had a great take on Battlestar Galactica. I don't know if anybody's ever watched Battlestar Galactica. See? Great show. Um, and he loved it, and he had a very insightful thing. He said, if you gave them a million dollars more per episode, it would have sucked. Yeah. Because it forced them to think out, you know, think differently, yeah. and think cheaper, and be more creative. Well, the show should, the creative should drive that choice. I mean, I really believe that certain shows like Westworld, for example. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think you could do a version of Westworld on the cheap that would that may live up to all of the expectations and the demands of a show that that needs to be in this very low tech, high tech world, mm -hmm. where the low tech may be as expensive as any of it. Right. And that really is a great decision. You go, okay, this is something that has to be done right. Let's do it. But it doesn't mean has, a great show can't be cheap. I mean, we talked about Fleabag. Mm -hmm. We talked about Catastrophe. These are, are incredibly inexpensive shows that, or Louis, that don't need money to be good right. because they are embracing things that don't require money. So at the end of the day, you're right. You can really seriously screw up a show. And constraints, actually, creatively. I think when we walked into the room on Van Helsing, and we'd learned this lesson on Continuum, we had a lot of money in the first season of Continuum because out of the gate, w w you have to introduce the show. On the first season of Van Helsing, we had like season three money of Continuum. I mean, it was already wow. nothing. Right. And so we, we were all very versed in like, what, are, what do we as fans love in our shows? What do we engage in? Well, we end up getting attached to characters, the relationships, and how they relate to each other. And we're doing a post-apocalyptic show. I mean, it is an ex inherently expensive show with vampires, visual effects, blood, every, I mean, get truckloads of blood, mm -hmm. um, makeup effects, set design. You are, your back is against the wall going in because you're like, how are we going to pull this dystopian ex world off? We have, no, we have no money to do it. So if people don't like Axel and Doc and Vanessa and Sam and... 
we're done. We're, it's over before it began. Mm -hmm. So we really, at the beginning, one of the things that I think was great about having Neil involved was that Neil didn't care about any of that shit. He was like, I don't care about the, we're not going to do the big outside world Mad Max. Mm -hmm. We're going to get into these fucked up people right and you and mind that and it was like phew because we can't pull the other thing off right we can pull off the personal stuff and that ends up being the best part of the show in see in episodes 8 9 10 11 12 and 13 which you build to mm -hmm. yeah we we get away from the the crazy apocalyptic universe that you think is what people are tuning in for hopefully they start that way mm -hmm. and they go oh yeah this is a nutty vampire infested universe but then it sort of fades, and hopefully other things become important. Whose idea was it to have, to, well, because Van Helsing as a character is, is sort of historic, to, to, to have her be Vanessa Van Helsing, and then also to have her the, basically the reverse power to turn someone back from vampire into human, which is a trick. Yeah, this was all part of this uh, six-page glossy sales document we were handed on this first day of the writer's room. It was It was this sales thing that was like, beautifully with this photo here <laughs> and uh and it had you know who creates that i want that job i think it was the for, i think it was a combination of the company that had pre was pre-selling it in the foreign markets they had they had put together this really glossy sales pitch and it's the kind of thing the writers put together a lot i mean i've, I've written a hundred of these things where you kind of lay out without the graphics and the photos, but you sort of pitch the show, here's the concept, here are the characters, here's where it's gonna go. It's like six pages. So we, we were handed that and said, here's your, here's your Bible. <laughs> and it had Vanessa, but it, it had a very different take on who she was and where she came from. And it had the idea that she could, uh, I think it had the idea that she could reverse the thing, yeah. So that was, the, that was her, that was the hook. Um, and there was a character named Axel, but it doesn't bear any resemblance to the one we end up with. And then a few other people that we, do we tossed and a few other concepts we tossed. But yeah, we knew it was going to be female. We, but we, but the, sh the document didn't explain why that was important. No one, there was no editorializing going, why is this a good thing? Right. We actually were all sitting around the table going, we need to get away from the Hugh Jackman movie. Yeah. And this gives us the opportunity to do that. So let's lean in to everything that that isn't. Mm -hmm. Let's lean into everything all the historical versions of Van Helsing in the past have been and not do that. Let's just take this as an opportunity to reinvent the myth. Mm -hmm. And that was really it. It was, it was really a way to escape expectations with a title that everyone knew. Wow. It's, that's, it's so, part of it's so cynical, right? <laughs> it <laughs> so is no, cynical. That's just a gloss. Here, make this show that we just made up out of thin air. Now you guys make it. Yeah. And we'll sell it in, in I don't know, China. But um, <laughs> it's, it's going to make money somewhere, probably. It's on, is it available in China? Cause probably. Damn it. Uh, no, I have no idea. But, um, but you and it's funny, we have a sort of a VIF deal here that we're going to talk about um, um, when we talk about creator talks, which this is. So... A year earlier, uh, we were in this very room talking, and um, we were on a panel, and one of, it was one of the panels was uh, was Warren, and Warren Littlefield who used to run NBC, and uh, producer you, Fargo, producer yeah. of Fargo, and you, which is I don't know if you Fargo is amazing, both seasons. Uh, you two have a deal, and I was trying to get out of them, like, what is this deal that you guys have going on, and what's going to happen? Um, and you were finally able to tell me that it was going to happen. And now, how many days later did it take? All right. So this is this is really embarrassing. Um, <laughs> so this exactly this time last year, I was announcing this uh, this new deal with MGM, with Warren Littlefield producing, which is a, an adaptation of a book series called These Broken Stars, which is a, a three volume. Um, kind of a Titanic in space, really. It's about a it's star crossed lovers in space. Mm -hmm. Go figure. <clears throat> and we had just sold it to Freeform and B Sky as a co production. So that was, yeah, this time last year. So um, I see Tim today. He goes, How's that thing going with uh, Warren? I said, Well, actually, funny you should ask. We just closed the deal. And he said, it Looked at me funny. Uh, yeah, it took 370 days <laughs> to close the deal of a show about traveling to space. By the way, you can travel to Mars from Earth, 
hang out there, and come back to Earth in less than 370 days, just as a point of reference. Um, and they couldn't actually get the lawyers to close the deal. So funnily enough, a year later, I will start writing this next week. But it took a year to close the deal. Not for me, for the companies who were going to make it to agree. And that's the funny part. It's, it had nothing to do with my deal. My deal is very straightforward. It's, the, it's these two big, big companies, Sky and Disney, who have to find a way to, to share. And it well, took them 378 days to do that. It, that's, it's, it's amazing. And it's, it's also the, I think this festival has stories like right. that. The opposite of Van Helsing. Right. The yeah. Maybe opposite. the show will get made some year, <laughs> right. as opposed to, I didn't even know Van Helsing existed <laughs> this time last year. Not. And it's already on the air. Yeah. And you're done with it. You've I'm it. done. I'm out. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's crazy that the other th thing we were talking about, I haven't even started writing. Yeah. So that's Hollywood. Yeah. And and you and, and oddly enough, I mean, you'll stop me if I'm talking about stuff I shouldn't be talking about. But so you 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 have another sci fi series where you will be coming in as the showrunner, but it's also kind of a similar situation where it was a pre done deal. But because you have this other deal with Warren and MGM, if that one goes first, you have to do that one. Yeah, first, you or? basically uh, when you make when you contract as a as a showrunner or as a as a producer, you get an, there's an order. Uh, it's called positions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the first the deal that is essentially your first position is the one that is has priority over you. Once they make that deal with you, you can take other work because as most writers here know. You can't count on the one job you think you have. You have to actually be out there hustling constantly. So with that awareness, those contractors can essentially activate your deal whenever they want. So anything you take after that, you have to disclose to the, the employer. Well, you are in second position or you are in third position in the event. But everyone knows that the business is so stupid that you can be out there selling shows, making shows, but most of the time they don't go. Uh, and you make your money, for the most part, on the things that don't get made, because that's the, that's the thing that carries you year in year out. And this, you know, I, I worked, I sold shows every year before Continuum for 15 years that never got made. I made a living as an unproduced writer that was quite good, never being produced. But but that's very important because I never knew they weren't going to be produced, right. and nobody else knew. But everyone was expecting, hoping that they would. So you have to be prepared just in case. You made a living making shows that didn't get made. Yeah, yeah that's fascinating. Yeah, I had, I saw, I had sold tw 13 pilots, and Continuum was the 14th pilot. Wow. Yeah. So and you, it was you were three that year. For 13. Three that year. I yeah. sold three that year. Continuum was one of three. The last one I thought right. was going to get made, by the way. It, yeah. was, it was way in my rearview mirror. Yeah. You thought that was never going to happen. Never going to happen. I mean, that's right. I mean, there's your lesson. There's a takeaway lesson to keep working on everything because no, nothing is guaranteed. No. Um, but it is a real weird uh, business, both for actors and writers and directors and producers, in that you can get deals. Like you did, where, but of course, I, I think you said an important thing. If you had known 13 wouldn't get made, you probably would have gone become a lawyer. Or no, something. it's easy to get discouraged if you know the odds are that bad. Right. Uh, you have to be a little bit thick-headed and mm -hmm. and um, pathologically arrogant in thinking you're going to be successful when you're not. Right. To believe that something good's going to happen. But at the end of the day, the lesson for me wasn't I got better. The lesson was I just lasted long enough for something good to happen. And the and, and I, that's, that's the advice I to every yeah. writer is like, don't the the number. It's a numbers game, and if you can play the numbers with uh, volume of material and volume of opportunity, then the odds start to shift in your favor. Regardless of whether you can con control the process or not, you just the the odds just get better because there's more opportunity out there. And honestly, it it but the the byproduct of that is you do get better as you every script you write, you right. you you get better at your craft. So right. hopefully, the thirteenth or fourteenth one actually is better than the first. <laughs> that it's it's phenomenal. It's a great it's a great thing about discipline and and stick to itiveness and. Everybody needs it, and the great thing about being in the f like at VIF is I I can actually see her here. I, that there's a filmmaker who's had successes and then had failures, and it's just that's part of it, right? You just got to keep going, and you got to yeah. keep trying to get in different festivals, and hope hopefully you get in. It really doesn't really it's not really a reflection of your work so much as it's someone else's 
um, taste at the time. Yeah. Uh, and you just never know. And you definitely not give up. And No, you have, there is definitely, I think, for all creative people, you understand, oh, there's a time where what I'm doing and how I'm doing it actually lines up with the zeitgeist and what what's happening. Right. If you're out, if you're watching TV and you're going, I don't like anything on TV, you probably shouldn't be writing TV mm -hmm. because you're you're out of sync. Mm -hmm. But if you feel like, oh no, I'm I'm in I I could be a Jill Soloway or I could be a, a Vince Gilligan, great because you're you're in sync, mm -hmm. so you just hammer away. Um, and it's but you don't get to decide when that happens. Right. It that's decided outside of you. Unfortunately, you just have to be prepared, ready when it does. Yeah. Well, also, I think one of the fascinating things right now as we look back on Continuum and you and you as a creator is that uh, you had a time travel series <laughs> <laughs> that you had to really... I'm suing everyone. So I had to sell people on. Um, and I can't tell you how many are on right now, but I know there's four network time travel series in America that are about to launch. Yeah, there's. I think there's actually six total. Six with, total. When you look at the mm -hmm. cable and Netflix and uh, there's now one, another one coming up yeah it's time travels hot yeah yeah i feel like i feel like the guy who uh who uh, invented the electric car in 1941 <laughs> that guy yeah. no I, mean, I think it's great i love time travel as a fan mm -hmm. but yeah you don't know i mean i don't think it'll mean anything so what, what happened in the water that there's six time travel shows in the same year i'm just assuming that everyone thinks they're stealing from a show that nobody saw right <laughs> yeah <laughs> Oh, nobody saw this shitty show. No Continuum. <laughs> I'll just steal that idea. Right? You poor Canadian. It's like, no one saw that Canadian show. I'll just steal everything there. And you're like, oh, hey, wait. I, I actually, you know, we're not that far from you, you know. We're no, I think, North I, American I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's just the expansive, like you said, when there's 500 shows, odds are there's one out of 100 are going to be time travel. Right. Well, um, so as you're, you know, behind the scenes on these, th I mean, you learned a lot with Continuum and our being here uh, last year and you were wrapping it up and it must have been grateful, you must be grateful to all this great feedback of how you did end it because ending a show, A, lots of people don't get to end their own so shows, certainly not on their own terms. No. Um, and you did it and you got amazing feedback. How, how has this, how has that process fed going into what you're doing now? Um, I think you, the uh, so the com sense of community from Continuum was really something I wanted to try and recapture now over and over again. Mm -hmm. The pleasure of working on a show that you uh, want to go to work on every day mm -hmm. is the is the best part of the business. Mm -hmm. And if you can if you can re reproduce that on the next thing and the next thing, you kind of tap into why that was so good and you try and reproduce it mm -hmm. through people and ideas and the spirit of what making a TV show is. So I guess the, the ultimately that's the, the legacy is how can I find the great um, <clears throat> uh, uh, collaborations mm -hmm. and and reproduce that again and hopefully have the same kind of success, not just uh, creatively, but personally. Right. Well, it's funny, too. Uh, why, I think there was a, something that you mentioned. I'm not sure where I read it, um, that you that you have rules of time travel. Um, and as somebody who's reviewing some of these time travel shows and working with another critic who's with, working with me, no one has, no one got your memo. No. There are, <laughs> no one really has the same rules. So uh, what, give us a little insight. If you're going to do something that's time travel -y, what, what can you can and can't do? Well, I think, uh, yeah, you have to, you have to, you have to plant your flag and say, are we in a timeline that is, uh, going to be affected by the past so that it has a ripple effect into the future? Or are we on a separate timeline where you can rewrite history and make a new future? And if a show doesn't know that basic principle, then they're, <laughs> they're fucked. Because <laughs> they, don't, they, they don't get it. Right. Uh, but I also think you have to, it's causality. Uh, ultimately, causality is the drama of time travel. What do you change now that me has meaning? What's the relevant meaning? On Continuum, it was a it was a constant battle to not time travel because it was too expensive to <laughs> change everything. <laughs> Therefore, we were constantly finding excuses to avoid time travel until it meant you know everything, and then we would find a way to cleverly do it. But we really only time traveled, I think, three times in four seasons, to, from the point of view of our our lead. Right. And but they had they had massive implications. Those three small trips mm -hmm. um, and I guess that's why shows like Timeless are going to have 
a troubling kind of because they're constant they're trying to that's the time travel of the week yeah and that's that's where you kind of want to blow your brains out as a writer because you i don't know how you sustain the stakes of that uh i think it's you know it's like back to the future three yeah it's a little messy. <laughs> yeah, it's a little messy at that point. <laughs> exactly. Well, yeah, um, as somebody who's been in the business and uh, and has seen, like, I think behind the scenes, it's kind of it's kind of funny because usually the end, all your stories end with we couldn't do that because there was no money, which is a little disheartening for everybody sitting here. <laughs> well, I Next year will be different, Tim. <laughs> Next year will be different. I'm gonna have too much money. That's my goal for right. 2017. Too much money. And you're going to be sitting there going, Simon, do you wish you had less money on that show? And I'll be going, yep, I wish yeah. I had less money. Yeah, because then you will make vinyl, right? And everybody will hate it. And they'll say, you $110 million on the pilot. What a load of crap, right? You were better when you could know, Protect me. Please. Yeah. yeah. Well, it is kind of funny. You make a uh, time travel series, and you only time travel three times in four seasons. Yeah. Um, so what... But as far as like being behind the scenes, which is part of what this is... What makes a good what makes a good writer's uh, room for starters, and then a secondary onto that? And I want to get to the questions for people in the audience as well. But what makes a good writer's room? And um, when you're directing something and you're the series creator, what are you trying? What are you hoping for in the casting uh, of actors and actresses, and then nurturing them as it goes? Kind of a bigger picture. Great question. I'll I'll refer to Van Helsing in this case because I think it was a great example of <clears throat> all of the diversity of both. So. Uh, in Van Helsing, we because Neil was an outlier in genre, immediately you had someone with a different point of view in charge, technically. Someone who wasn't... Uh, like it's funny, we used to joke that Neil was the only non-nerd in the room. I mean, Neil's a big nerd in his own way, but he's like a rock and roll nerd <laughs> and a play nerd. But he's not a sci-fi horror nerd. So it was great to have someone who was like thought we were all weirdos, which was good because that made a great referee and someone who probably had a much truer line of drama without getting excited about stupid things like you know vampire mythology where you know Jonathan and I could go off for days talking about where did the, where did the vampires actually were they dug up in Transylvania in World War II by the Nazis who were trying to figure out how to make a super soldier and and then then they built a lab and then the lab got destroyed and then a vampire got out and, and he was looking at us going oh my god you guys are such idiots <laughs> but we got excited about like where did vampires come from in the in the 20th century we had a whole mythology of Nazis digging up Dracula because when they annexed Romania, whoa, we were like out there. But you know, that's a good example of the diversity of points of view. You need someone who's going to go check that. You know, breaks on. Let's get back to business of television. And and but you also need someone who gets excited about the crazy Nazi uh, scientists yeah. building vampires in the lab because you need a little of that of both. So on Van Helsing, we had a very um, a, a room that was checking each other, but also excited about the prospect of a show that was going to be a true genre show, a sci-fi show. And then <clears throat> continuing that ideal was when we cast the show, the idea was let's get a bunch of actors who don't belong together. In a, like you look at them and you go, wrong. Mm -hmm. But because the, it's wrong, it, it's right. Because it's a sampling of survival, survival and you want these different uh, behaviors and different attitudes and different uh, beliefs. And so in casting uh, Van Helsing, it was really a challenge to go, how are we going to create tension just based on the fact that the people who survived don't want to be together, are the wrong people to hang out together. That they're really, because if we can't make humans as scary as vampires, we failed. Right. Like you should be more worried about the guy next to you or the girl next to you than the vampire outside. Otherwise, we don't have a show. So we really felt like from the room to the casting, we needed that underlying sense that oh, here's a great group of actors, all uh, immensely equipped to, to perform. But that in characterization, there's just this surface. Underneath the surface, you know when they get alone, it's not going to be good. And really, nothing more complicated than that, because then you can mine it. Then you add the context to that, and then things happen. 
That's amazing. So basically, you took like the world's worst cocktail party atten <laughs> attendees, yeah. and then they all lived, and they had to like, yeah. Good dinner parties make terrible television. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, uh, so on your next uh, sci-fi one that they've dreamt up for you, you have a ghost town. So what? What? Tell, tell, give us a little hint about the, your thought process there, because it's always interesting to talk to writers who have to, and John's well, yeah. how you have to create from scratch something that A, has uh, people have seen before in some context. It's not brand new, um, but you have to make it different but familiar enough. It's got to sell, all these things. So how, what are, what are you, what's going through your mind for this well, show? Well, for, for this ghost show, we, uh, we kind of went old school. Um, when I grew up, movies like uh, The Changeling and The Shining and The Exorcist had a huge impact on me. And I think they had a big impact because... Uh, they tapped into this realm of the unknown that was clearly mythological. Your grandparents talked about it. Your parents, every every town, every family has their ghost story, mm -hmm. and every everyone probably in this room knows somebody, if not themselves, who has a paranormal experience with the uh, the 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 ghost realm. And I thought that's that's the best thing we have going for us is that this is part of even though we live in the 21st century and we have technology and we have science, this has al allowed this is allowed to persist. Weirdly, I think we'll, we'll probably dump religion before we dump the idea of ghosts. Right? right? It's weird. Like ghosts seem to to be um, this pervasive thing that we can't get rid of, and yet uh, in the modern age, at least. Ghosts have been kind of handled in a more of the horror mm -hmm. realm as opposed to the suspense realm. So I was really trying to come up with a, a show that was about people and the intimacy of ghost stories. Mm -hmm. That 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 the that the notion of life and death and uh, and what the ghost realm is, um, especially in the 21st century, could actually merge with the scientific. So we have we have a, sh a story that involves quantum physics as a component, mm -hmm. and that the mysteries of quantum physics could be argued to be as m mysterious as the mysteries of the afterlife, and that maybe those two things could converge. So it's really, it was really an opportunity to tap into our own um, fears and, uh, and, and also our own ignorance about life and death and have fun with it. And how did how did I mean how did that go? That's 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 I mean because there's very little to go on. I mean you said you were yeah. Well, it became a little bit of a nerdy element. It sounds like you might that's have some mythology. Sexy ghosts. Yeah, well, that's mythology. Yeah, yeah. There was that sexy ghost movie. Oh, don't forget Can't Casper. Remember. Casper, was a friendly ghost. Oh, is the, the 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 dead child. Yeah, yeah. yeah remember, let's not forget. It's about a dead child. Okay. Um, Way to go, dark. Yeah, go, that's the dark version. Uh, no, we 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 thought, yeah, there there has to be again a an engine of character that is. Um, um, that where those stories without the ghost stuff should be as interesting and and as dynamic. So we we the story about a small town actually becomes a character. The the town itself mm -hmm. and anyone who knows. I mean, living in BC, I think we have a we have a, a, a close relationship with small towns because we only have to drive a half hour to get to one, mm -hmm. and we all understand sort of the nature of the community. So community stories. Uh, the intimacy of relationships in a small town where people are self-reliant, and then add to that the the unknown of of death and life and and the netherworld between creates like a a bonding and a an opportunity to tell kind of you know scary intimate stories with people who all know each other's business and all know each other's stakes and and also the idea that we all have our own skeletons mm -hmm. and the ghosts are kind of part of that story that yeah. everyone has like a ghost in their past well I, I'm, I'm assuming that if you like to tell stories that even though we kind of we, we kind of talked about the the downside of not having it something be your own baby and you come up with it and from scratch like continuum or whatever and someone's giving is giving a show to you if you're a storyteller that has its own great possibilities even though it might not on the surface seem ideal tell me a little bit about the this one on sci-fi and the other one that maybe for MGM where it's based on a series of three books well you're always doing all of those things I mean the thing about it is uh, being a writer you are constantly inventing original ideas, adapting uh, other people's ideas into TV, 
and uh, being put in these crazy opportunity boxes of, hey, do a show about this. And that actually, even without the what we've talked about, has been happening constantly over the, uh, the last 10 years, where a graphic novel comes on your desk or um, an idea of yours gets catapulted into another realm that you didn't imagine, and then they, people want you to change it into something else. So it's not unusual um, to be in that mindset, and you're always balancing them. Right. Like, even though I'm uh, going to do this other thing, which is definitely, here's the box, make the show, I'm still out there uh, working with Warren on this series of books I'm adapting, which is very different process, and still pitching original ideas. So it's, it's never like you feel like I'm doing one thing. Right. You're always doing five things, and you don't know which of the five is going to be the thing that we're talking about next year. Right. So it, 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 you, it's easy to avoid the trap of thinking I'm not being a creator. But the same skill set is applied the whole time. Yeah. It's the same process. Yeah. I like the idea crazy opportunity boxes is what you it said. It is a crazy <laughs> opportunity box. But this is what it is. Even it's not a bad title. No. I bet I mean even if it's a graphic novel Jonathan Hickman who writes amazing graphic novels and I are collaborating on one of his graphic novels. And John Hickman does these outlandish worlds. And um, that's an opportunity box in a way that he can't write the TV show and, no, and says openly, he's like, I don't think this will ever be a show. And I'm like, I think it can be. Let, let's together figure it out because I think I know how to make the show. That's an opportunity box on a title that is, um, that's a great challenge. And that's part of the job of writing TV is like finding the show in the idea that someone else is that they don't even believe themselves right. is there. Yeah, that's fun. Yeah, that's kind of fascinating. And now, before we get to these these folks, hopefully we'll have a microphone that can go around to people. Um, tell me just quickly what it was like where you are someone you just you mentioned a series of ideas that you're either working on for shows that are coming up. Um, you've talked about the long process of gestation and how everybody's got to stick to it, but all of it involves this element of being um, open to creation. Like the the guys like oh, I, I do graphic novels, I don't know how to make this. You're like I I know how to make this a TV show. How was it where you went for on Van Helsing, where you were somebody who was collaborative, and you brought in somebody like Neil, or so you were paired with someone like Neil Labute, who was who's used to working by himself. Yeah. So Neil had never collaborated before as a writer. His whole career. Uh, he had never written with anybody. And then he went from that to work in a room with six people. So you can only imagine for a guy like Neil, who had been as isolated creatively as you can probably get, and whose brand was really predicated on his very specific point of view about the world, about men and women and the relationships, walking into a room with a bunch of writers like staring at him going, you're, oh my god, you're Neil Abiot. like You're famous. Because <laughs> we're play nerds and screenplay nerds. And, and I think it was probably weird for him to um, not only deal with it, just the social impact of that, which you know lasted only an hour because he's very funny and charming and easygoing, to the process of collaborating where he was essentially giving up his authorship mm -hmm. and going, uh, we're going we're gonna to do something together and it won't work if we don't do it together. And that was great. So you could have had a nightmare. That could have been a nightmare scenario with another personality of that type who came in and was like, uh, I don't need you guys. Uh, go have a coffee break. This is on. I'll do it all. And you were like, oh, great. Like, that can happen. And I've heard stories of that where, you know, super creatives come into a room and just alienate everyone and decide that's not about them anymore. Right. So Neil was basically, I think, as freaked out as we were and openly honest about that we were all kind of in this impossible situation that didn't need to be bad. It could be fun. So he had a great attitude. Mm -hmm. And he was very collaborative, very open. And I think he's, you know, and the thing about Neil is, and I think it's important, and everyone here, I think it's important to understand, if you don't love television, if you don't watch television, consume television almost obsessively, it's really hard to do what we do. Mm -hmm. um, not only... Uh, creatively, because you have to get excited every day, you have to get up every morning, go to work, and work, you know, for a year. So if you don't love TV as just a general rule, it's that's probably hard. But also, the conversation is all shorthand. And the wonderful thing about Neil was we could talk in shorthand with him because he watches everything, wow. like 
I mean, he would come. He would come into work in the morning, and he'd watched a whole season of a show the night before. He like he stayed up till three a.m. because mm -hmm. he watched the first and he loved it, and he just right. went through. So Neil was really a. Uh, uh, he had the great vocabulary of a TV viewer, which is a unifying, universal language that we all speak. Whether you've written a script or not, we can all talk watching TV. You and I can talk about watching TV all day long. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a really great starting place because we could just use reference points of shows and what was on, what was working, what wasn't working. And invariably, when you go into a writer's room, whatever is on TV that is new at that time becomes the conversation. Yeah. So you can't help it because it's, that's what everyone wants to talk about. So that became a way into, into understanding what he liked. Mm -hmm. So we could say, oh, he's watching this show and he likes this aspect of it. That's good. Now we know what Neil likes. Right. So we can kind of lean into that and mm -hmm. give him his due because he wasn't, we weren't dealing with a show that was his creation. So we had to kind of steer the process towards what we thought was his, his uh, aesthetic, yeah. which was fun. Yeah. And it was all in the language of the current zeitgeist of television, yeah. which we were all absorbing. Well, it's, it's also kind of exciting. We talked out, out while you guys were watching this about um, what's working on t TV, and it must be really interesting, and this probably applies to people who are creatives themselves, that um, things that you didn't know you would like or you didn't look good on paper and it works, or things that work and they shouldn't work, and now everybody's talking about them, like Stranger Things, if you've watched that on Netflix, um, where it's, it's really just rehashing other things, but it became its own thing, and we talked a little bit about, um, I'm not sure if you guys have seen it, because I don't think you, Canada gets Amazon, but there's a series from, uh, from the BBC called Fleabag, that's out now. Um, that's fantastic. But the but the actress, the playwright who did the series, breaks the fourth wall and and talks to the to the camera, which is usually a no no. And as a critic, I see that I'm like, Ugh. but she's amazing, and it's, she's like, wow, she did it the perfect way. You can do it. So it must be nice to uh, to know that you can be creative at any time in any genre. Yeah, I mean, the the truth is now, I think almost anything goes. Right. If you can execute well. There is no idea that isn't worthy of television. It's just it really is about the uniqueness of the execution and the and the quality of that that will define your show ultimately. Because some shows that are on the air that are great, you can't even pitch them. Right. You just can't. There's yeah. no pitch. They right. just are executed so extraordinarily well that you have to give them attention. Oh, well, we have some mics here. Let's open it up to people who want to ask questions. Hey Simon, you said the show was uh, inexpensive. How much, how much does, uh, did it cost with uh, pre and post production to shoot that pilot? The Van Helsing budget, I think, was two, two point two Canadian. It's about one point nine U.S., which is half the budget of a normal American show on cable. Oh, hi. Um, I'm a screenwriting uh, student. And I love sci-fi, and I love TV. So my question is, uh, what are you looking for when you bring writers into the room? Uh, well, every room is like uh, a, you want to build a uh, group of people who, at a dinner party, would all get into a fight. You want people who don't agree on anything almost, but still understand, can still articulate their point of view in a way that everyone understands that they have a point of view that is has a valid uh, uh, perspective. The, the last thing you want is everyone just nodding in the writer's room. So it's really incumbent on any showrunner or any producer to find a group of people who all understand what we're all trying to do, but all want to come at it from a different point of view. And that way, you get uh, a lively conversation where you're getting disagreements, but you know, respectfully. You know. Um, and then that's part one. Part two is you want a writer who can execute uh, in the voice of the show. So most writers, and I think all anyone in the room here who writes understands who they are as a writer. It's the natural process of writing is you develop a voice, you develop a style of writing that is you and expresses the way you like stories told and, and characters. As a television writer, you have an, a secondary obligation to mimic the writing of the show that you're on. So you have to be able to keep, to almost uh, uh, do an impression of the head writer, whoever that is. So the shows that are very specific, like Mad Men, 
the tempo of the dialogue, the way the characters relate to each other, the structure of the show, all the writers in that show had to mimic the style of Matt Weiner, but yet still be unique enough and different enough that they would catch his attention and get their own episodes. So it's a very fine balance. It's not like movie writing um, at all. You, it's, it's a collaborative process where you want to be independent, but you also understand that you have to sound like every other writer that you're working with. That's the best way I can describe it. Hi. Uh, you went through the process of how this came to be. It was sort of a concept before it was a, anything. But it has had that vague, inspired by this graphic novel. Did you take anything from the graphic novel, or was there any pressure to hold certain We didn't concepts? even know there was a graphic novel until three months in. Uh, <laughs> no one told us. Literally, we got the sales that we were talking about, and then on a phone call, someone mentioned a graphic novel. We were like, graphic novel? What graphic novel? And it was this uh, crazy, whoa, we didn't know there was a, should we look at it? And they were like, no, 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 don't look at it. <laughs> OK, I've still not seen the graphic novel. I have no idea. I mean, it's, it, that's another layer of the bizarreness of what we do. <laughs> that is totally absurd, by the way. That's yeah. awesome. They're getting paid, though. Yeah. Um, uh, 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 Simon, uh, uh, was it your choice for Van Helsing to film here? And for your new shows, uh, do you also ha have the choice of filming location? Well, I always will vote for Vancouver first if I have the choice, yeah. Um, because it's easier for me to work from home, number one. <laughs> and number two, this is my community. I know all the people I want to work with are here already, the actors, the writers, the, the craftspeople, the technicians, everyone that I believe in and I that supports me and makes me look good is already here and working. And so it's crazy for me to go outside Vancouver if I don't have to. Van Helsing was symptomatic of uh, the actually the Calgary uh, Alberta tax credit the producers who do Fargo and Hell on Wheels, <clears throat> in Alberta, they have a tax credit cap. When you spend a certain amount, you can't spend, you can't get the tax credits if you go above it. So they had been forced to shoot it in BC because they couldn't get Alberta to give them tax credits because they had already maxed their cap out. So when they came to BC, part of their their mission was to find someone in BC who was going to help them put together the crew and the process and the production the new BC in a way that they didn't uh, personally. So it was an opportunity for me. It was one of the, another reason, other than Neil, another reason for me to say yes to this, because it was here. And, and I knew that I could hire people that I wanted to work with. So that's a big part of the, the attraction, for sure. Hi, Simon. Um, can you speak about your 13 unsold pilots? <laughs> and, uh, They're all awesome. They, were they? You should read they, them. They're really they good. Like, were they like different genres, or were they yeah, similar? Did you No, they're all them? everything you can imagine a whore would do <laughs> as a writer. Um, <laughs> it's a real mess. No, they're a little bit of everything. They're what I would love to have done. They're what people paid me to do. They're things I didn't want to do but did because I was broke. Um, you name it. I mean, this, I'll just give you a sample of the titles, and you can probably guess. Oh, this is going to be awesome. Ah, this okay. is going to be good. So there's um, FBI Soccer Mom. <laughs> what? <laughs> Did you really? FBI Soccer Mom. What? For, for Aaron Spelling, wrote that one for him. Uh, <laughs> this is going to be good. I'm going to roast myself right now. This is going to make um, our after-dinner drinks yeah. so much better. There's... Um, I'm just going to give you the bad ones because you know the good ones are still in play. That's the truth. Um, there was um, before the fact. That's a good network show, right? Mm -hmm. It was about someone. This was way before um, Joe and Nolan's show about the, the computer with uh, person of interest. interest. This is like ten years ago, maybe twelve. It was about a hacker who had accidentally. Uh, post, post right after 
had f tapped into the NSA and figured out that there was an algorithm that would predict when a crime would happen before it would happen right. using the new counterterrorism uh, algorithm that, that the government had based. So I did a, that where he was like totally incapable of doing anything in the real world, great in the cyber world, and so had to be partnered with a Luddite cop who hated computers, used, you know, a rotary phone. No, he didn't use a rotary <laughs> phone. Hated computers, thought that all this technology was a bunch of hocus pocus. And so they, but together they could be an effective thing. <laughs> and NBC just stole that? Yeah. They heard this somewhere yeah. and they stole So it. that was one that didn't get made. Probably for a good reason, though. One of them that didn't get made that I actually love, mm -hmm. that I understand didn't get made, was called Skunk. And any music fans here? Anyone yes. love the Doobie Brothers or Steely Dan? No? Anyone? Steely Dan? Doobie Brothers? Okay, so the, the bass player for Steely Dan and the Doobie Brothers is a guy named Jeff Skunk Baxter. Oh, right, huh? You know? Looks like a Harley mm -hmm. guy, you know, long hair, pork, you know, pork chop, sideburns. <clears throat> Happens to be, uh, have the highest security clearance of any civilian in the United States. Weird, right? Why? He is a uh, sound acoustic nerd and helped the Navy develop technology to find submarines and locate other ships in the ocean because he helped invent the synthesizer. So he had this, all this knowledge about digital sound from his, his music career. And while he was with Steely Dan and Doobies in the 70s, was recruited by the Pentagon to spy on wow. tour because the, they were touring countries that diplomats couldn't go to. How is this not on the air? I'd watch this. And it was an second. awesome show. I, I well, totally watched it. I couldn't that. do it. I, I wanted to set in the 70s, and they said no. So I did a contemporary version where he's like in Coldplay. And he's. <laughs> oh, now, now I'm definitely. Now you know why it's called Tar, right? I'm definitely not watching it not now. Not the Coldplay, but a band like Coldplay. And he's like this guy who has to spy, and the band's like, do you just want to make music? Why are you just <laughs> spying all the time? And so. <laughs> It's a long, it's a litany of embarrassing things. Um, are you sick of this yet? Okay, can I stop? They're just all Keep bad. Keep going, yeah. yeah. So that was a good one. I actually like that script. I, think I love that one. I I that, that, that one I was really disappointed didn't get made. Um, I wrote one for uh, USA called, uh, based on a, on a graphic novel called Felon, which was about a, uh, a woman who is a uh, very good thief who gets out of jail and takes on the identity of the FBI agent who put her away, steals her identity and starts basically fucking up, fucking with her life to the point where they have to team up because the person she, the, she ended up, she was working for as a thief wants to kill her and they become best friends and have to stop. What are you guy. dreaming these up at night? Well, some of them, like, this one was from a graphic novel from uh -huh. Top Cow. Mm -hmm. uh, Skunk, I, I saw him at a, at a, sh at a, at a concert, mm -hmm. I met him, and I, and I started talking to him, and he pulled out his Pentagon pass, and I was like, huh? No, it's, that's, a great, that's a great series. Yeah, um, and then you never know where they come from. Sometimes it's the executive, sometimes it's you, sometimes you're, you've had too much wine. And well, you know, we, there's a VIF tradition. We were down. actually at this, again, circling back to we were here in this room, uh, on another panel, and now this is actually going to come full circle. Let me close with this. So the the show that you're taking on in the ghost town, mm -hmm. um, because uh, what Simon said, he needed to be in. He's in first position for the MGM series. Um, you said you have to bring on somebody who's already been a showrunner and has the skills to do it. And that person is Dennis Heaton. And. Mm -hmm. so Dennis, Dennis, Dennis and I are collaborating. Yeah, it's from Motive. From and Motive. Dennis sat on this stage, and we joked a year ago about titles. I don't know what brought that up, but what, what, what did Dennis come up with? Dennis was doing what I'm doing right now. He was pitching the shows that he had come up with that hadn't fail, had failed. And he pitched Ghost Car, which was a show about a cop who ends up with a dead partner who rides with him and helps solve crimes. <laughs> totally awesome. Ghost Car. I want that Ghost right Car. Out. Yeah, I actually like Ghost Car. I'm gonna I'm gonna turn that one around. Ghost Car and Scum. Um, yeah, but the, the the truth is, the all of them. I learned something on all of them. Uh, I I I learned what I didn't want to be, in a lot of cases. I learned that I you know whoring is good when you're when you need to pay the rent, but it's not good if you want to 
have a have a, a, a long career, and uh, and I learned uh, that um, you have to work with a lot of people in the industry um, to understand how people think and how what the expectations are of what you do, and they all had benefits. I mean, and I don't regret. I mean, any of the any of the wasted hours and and head banging against the desk and computers, I might have snapped in half. Uh, but the it, it is a uh, it, it all seems stupid at the time. And then reflecting back, you go, no, it wasn't stupid. But at the t I thought Continuum was um, a lark when I, when I came. I was stuck in traffic on Santa Monica Boulevard, wishing my car could fly over the cars mm -hmm. so I could get to the meeting I was late for. And then thinking about the future and thinking about you know how the f what the future would look like and blah, blah, blah. And then suddenly you have a TV show. So it can be as, so, the, so, so you never want to be, as ang you don't want to be mean to your own process or or diminish the value of the process because you never know what will come out of it and you just won't have to constantly be open to the stupid and the silly just in case well this is uh hopefully people who are either actors writers or creators got something out of this because it's kind of an amazing process of that behind the scenes um and it's great to know that you've failed 13 times uh, and then it took off. I'm still failing, trust yeah. me. Well, I mean, everybody is, right? And then you're so, and some of those 13 may end up being shows. Skunk may be a show. It's a, I love that idea. I wrote three pilots last year that all got rejected. Yeah. I, I mean, in the middle of all of the good stuff, I'm still coming up with new ideas, still writing them, still getting rejected. So take heart. Yeah. <laughs> Keep the a lot of and yeah. just keep going as long as you want it to. Yeah. Well, the stick to this is amazing, and um, I just wanted to say um, let's let's give Simon a round of applause for coming out and telling us this backstory. <laughs> and thanks to everybody here for uh, supporting Vif and coming out and and trying to get a little bit of how the sausage gets made. Hopefully, uh, this hour helped. Thank thanks you a so lot. Round, Tim. <laughs>